ADM is crashing almost 20% down just today. It is at its 52 week lows, but is it a buy? Is it undervalued? And why on earth is it crashing? We're going to find out all the answers in today's episode. We're going to take a look at the historical performance of the company. We're going to look at their top line revenues as well as their bottom line net income growth. We'll see what is the health of this company, their total cash versus their total debt. We'll also compare their performance over the last five years versus some of their well-known competitors. We'll see whether the institutions are still buying or selling. We'll take a look at the insiders. Are the CEOs of vice presidents buying, selling? We'll take a look at that dividend safety score, looking at their financial metrics. Is this a strong, high quality company? And we'll actually find out what is going on. Why is this crashing down a monumental 18% right now? And as always, we'll run it through our valuation model, getting to our intrinsic value and our acceptable buy price, given our investor margin of safety, and see what Wall Street are forecasting for this company over the next 12 months. Now, before we jump into the analysis of the company, let's take a look right now and understand what is going on. Why is this stock dropping, crashing so hard? We can see Financial Times just released this article, the commodity trader ADM probes accounts and puts the finance chief on leave. Now that sounds horrendous. Let's take a quick look into the meat of this article. So we can see they have essentially placed their CFO, their chief financial officer on leave and in fact delayed their quarterly earnings release, which is definitely not good news. The reason for this, they are investigating their accounting practices in their nutrition business. So not good news at all. Very, very bad. Alarm bells should be ringing. And we can see he has been the finance chief officer for nearly two years. He is now on admin leave with immediate effects. So this does smell very fishy. Now, one thing that I do want to point out to this article, we can see, in fact, the shares in the pre-market were down around 10%. They're now aging more towards that 20%. And we can see one thing that I just want to bring to your attention in terms of the value of this business. Their nutrition business, which is where the question is, generated around 468 million of the group's 4.67 billion operating profits. So we can see it makes up around 10% of their operating profits. Still, if there is an issue that they have found with one business, who's to say it doesn't extend into other parts of the business? But nevertheless, let's take a look and see what is going on on a more granular level. And also, they are now expecting to report $6.90 in adjusted earnings, whereas their forecast was $7. So let's take a look. Now we can see it is 18.5%. It is still falling. Over the last year now, they're down 35%. It is trading at the 52-week low, which is getting lower and lower as the price drops today. The yield is slightly higher than this. We'll touch upon that shortly. And the forward PE is sitting around nine. Now, if you've been holding this company over the last 10 years without including those dividends reinvested, you'd be up around 40%. We can see their all-time highs in 2022 of just under $100, nearly double the current trading price. So let's take a look. Top line revenue, now typically what we like to see, three to 7% growth year on year. 64 billion they reported in 2018. December 2022, 102 billion. So they've nearly doubled their top line over the last five years. We do note from their December 2023, so they're trailing 12 months, they are expecting to show a drop from the previous year around 97 billion. And when we do take a look at their top line on a more granular level, we can see, in fact, from 2018 to 2020, their top line did not move pretty flat before jumping very strongly in 2021 and again in 2022. So yes, their top line has been increasing over the last five years, but bear in mind, it is very inconsistent. Bottom line, well, pretty much a very similar story. 1.8 billion in 2018, 4.3 billion in 2022. And again, they are expecting a drop from the previous year. And we can see those inconsistencies year on year. So a similar theme, both their revenue and net income is increasing year on year. But within that, on a granular effect, there are a lot of inconsistencies. Quick health check, total cash versus total debt is gone from around 2 billion in 2018 to around 1.5 billion. So they now hold less cash than they did five years ago. Not necessarily a red flag indicator, but let's compare that to their total debt numerically and directionally. We can see their total debt has gone from around 8.4 billion to around 9.5. So not that bad. In actual fact, it hasn't increased that much. 
when you do compare it to their total cash. But we will look at that net debt to EBITDA metric shortly to see how well this company is looking overall. Now, comparing them to some other companies in the agricultural product and services industries, we have some names here that we can see that are well known within this sector. Now, this is total returns so over the last year. This is the worst performing. And let's be honest, that is pretty much due to the effect of today's share price drop. So negative 33 percent. We can see in actual fact only two of their competitors did have a positive performance over the last year. And when we extend that to the last five years, we can in actual fact see that they are up still around 46 percent. But again, half of the industry are showing negative returns. We have FDP and CRESY as negative. But as I always say, anyway, past performance isn't an indicator of future performance, just something to consider moving forwards. Institutional ownership, well, 78% as we can see here. 3.5 billion worth of sales over the last 12 months. And during that same time period, we see around 6.2 billion worth of buys, nearly twice as much. One thing to point out in 2023, Q1, Q2 and Q3 saw more buying than selling. Q4, in actual fact, we saw the opposite with institutions selling more than buying. As always, take this with a pinch of salt. Don't ever rely on what institutions do for your own investment, but it is always good to add as part of your investment package piece. Now let's take a look at the insider trading. What we've done is we've took a look at buys and sells of ADM. And over the last six months, the only thing we can note here is that in 26th of July, the vice president did sell around one and a half thousand shares at a cost of 126,000. Now, one thing to note for those that are new, insider selling isn't a really bearish signal. Insiders do sell for many reasons, including personal reasons, financial reasons. But what I would say, we don't see it here, but in any other company, insider buying is typically a bullish signal. The reason for this is realistically management only buy shares if they believe the share price is going to go up over the next few years, weeks or months, depending on their own investment thesis. So let's take a look at that essential dividend safety and financial metrics. It is sitting at a score of 94, very safe. Market cap, 36 billion, a large cap company. And when we take a look at those recessionary metrics, now we can see over the last recession, they did in fact increase the dividend. They had below average growth of negative 21%, as we can see here. The average growth of companies in the S&P 500 was around 12%, and they also significantly outperformed the S&P negative 21% versus the S&P's negative 55 Dividend growth, well, in fact, last January, they increased that dividend double digits, 13%. So realistically, over the next few days, we should be expecting an increase to their dividend. Last five years, 5% on average. Last 20 years, 11%. Nice to see double digits over a long period. Now, very important to note here that they are three years away from becoming a dividend king. They have increased those dividends for 47 years or more. And on top of that, they have been paying dividends without a reduction for 92 years absolutely phenomenal now as we go through we can see dividend yield theory now what that states a company is undervalued if the current yield sits above the five-year average we have our sign here 3.22 versus 2.48 bear in mind that we're not looking at any of these models in isolation we will draw conclusions towards the end of the episode and then we see another sign of undervaluation with the forward pe 8.7 versus 13.7 sector p as well for consumer staples sits significantly higher at 19.5 so let's take a look at the free cash flow payout as always earnings we ignore it is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting free cash flow i do prefer it around below 60 percent is what i typically would say over the longer term and this is one reason why we do focus on free cash flow if we look at expected 2023 we're looking at around 23 percent for the earnings Whereas what we can see here on the free cash flow, 196%, this signals that the management are expected to pay more in dividends and they're expecting to generate in free cash flow. A red flag indicator, in my opinion, 2022 was 42%, 2023 very, very high. The positive to note here, however, is 2024, they are expecting to bring it significantly lower. Free cash flow per share, well, the mixed feelings here, 652 in 2013, it's lower in 2022, expected to go lower in 2023, and there's five years of negative free cash flow per share. So there is a bit of a worry, something I would just think about as an investor moving forwards, although we can see 2024 expected $4.90 for free cash flow per share. 
Sales growth then, we can see they have been through a very tough time. Again, you can argue the cyclicality of the industry that we see five years of negative growth. 2021 and 2022 was very strong double digit growth. 2023, unfortunately, was negative 2% or it is expected. And we can see that cyclicality and the growth 90 billion to 102 billion in 2022. One thing that is nice, they do return excess cash to investor pockets, but we can see it isn't very consistent. It's gone from 663 million to 548. Now, ROIC, this is one that I would advise you to take important note of. I personally look at 10% or more. This gives me faith that management are able to effectively allocate their capital. And we can see 2022, nice to see above 10%. 2023 expected the same, but there are many years where they have struggled. So something just to consider moving forwards. This does worry me a lot, the operating margin. It is very low. The only thing I would say it has been increasing from 2013, the last two years at 4%. If their margins do get squeezed, even by a percentage point or two, it will signal some trouble for this company. But just something to keep an eye on, although we do know it has been historically at these very low levels. And the same can be said for the free cash flow margin. 1% in 2023 is a bit of a worry in my opinion. Now, net debt to EBITDA earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization signals the balance sheet strength as well as dividend safety. As always, these are the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. 2022, 1.29. 2023 expected slightly lower. That is positive, significantly below 4, so we can see why that dividend looks to be very safe. And as we did our balance sheet review, they do have a fairly strong balance sheet. So now let's take a look at the valuation model. As always, if you enjoy the content values being provided, smash that like button, hit the subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Now, one thing to note just before we do jump into this video, we have started a free weekly newsletter. We just dropped the latest edition yesterday where we run through our seven golden dividend metrics, talking about how we schedule and look for undervalued stocks, the different types of metrics. And over the next few weeks, we will be doing deep dives into some stocks that are on our watch list. Just to gain access, just click on that pinned link below. It is free and you will get some very nice weekly newsletters. So let's jump into the valuation model. Now, Graham's valuation, we have the stock ticker symbol, the earnings per share. Now, with that current yield on AAA corporate bonds, we get an intrinsic value of $48. Now, market value showing signs of overvaluation. But as always, we don't look at any of these models in isolation and we will draw our conclusions towards the end. We then have the multiples valuation model, companies in a similar sector and size. When we get their average PE and we can see the average of ADM, you get the intrinsic value on this model and we can see here a signal of undervaluation. We then move on to the dividend discount model. Nice growth rate over the period. There are some years, in fact, of nice double digit growth. On average, we've gone for 6%, pretty much in line with the average over the period. This gives an intrinsic value of $95, market value 57. So again, nice signs of undervaluation. We then have the DCF model, the discounted cash flow model with the free cash flows. Forward looking growth rate per analyst estimates in conjunction with the discount rate. We get those present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the shares outstanding. Divide that by the equity value to get an intrinsic value of $91. Again, that is the third sign of undervaluation. So the intrinsic value for ADM in today's episode is the average of these four models coming to $74. Now, as always, you can click on the pinned comment below if you do want to grab a copy of this valuation model to get to the intrinsic value and acceptable buy price of companies in your own portfolio. So for ADM, we typically start off with a margin of safety of 10%. We use this if we believe it has a wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward looking data. Now, I would say after the news of this CEO essentially or CFO essentially being placed on leave, it doesn't just raise question marks on the revenue that they have talked about, also other revenue streams. So it is one that if I was looking to invest in, I would be looking at a much higher margin of safety. At 20%, we can see it is about up to $59. 25%, it isn't too far off, and I wouldn't be surprised if it does hit that over the next few hours. So I would see around a 25% margin of safety for ADM at the current price. In terms of Wall Street, well, they believe this is a strong buy with a forecast of up to $93 of 63% upside. Now, one thing to bear in mind with this Wall Street price forecast, this has been made before the news of today. So it is something just to keep an eye on and to see what Wall Street do in terms of their price target, whether or not they do lower it. But based on the information that we have, they are seeing a 63% upside 
with a price target of $92.50. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments below, whether or not you're a shareholder or whether or not now this is something that looks attractive to you, whether it's in a value play or a long-term play. As always, have a great day. Don't forget to subscribe to that free weekly newsletter. If you want to grab a copy of this valuation model as well, everything is in the pinned comment. Have a great day. Catch you on the next episode and take care.